This is my man Doug, who is helping us set up the little tabletop rig that we've got going today. What's important to think about tethering is what it provides you for functionality. It provides you instant review, mm -hmm. provides you organizational capabilities like ranking, star rating, color tagging. It allows you to check the images like zooming into 100% or checking the exposure and do so from some position other than within two feet of the screen in the back of the camera that you're working with. So gotcha. tethering is a kind of a broad word. It means some ability to review other than from right here. Right. Right. So we can do tethering by USB or Firewire, uh, and we can go into the computer and use Cache One. And that would be the traditional kind of, most people are familiar with Cable that, yeah. tethering. Cable tethering. Okay. Right. And then another option we have here is directly from the digital back without the cable, so we can unplug the cable, Without the cable, we can still do wireless to the iPad, uh, okay. iOS device, so it could be a phone, it could be an iPad, it could be an iPad Pro. Wow. What that allows us to do is cut the cable, right? So if I'm shooting handheld through the street, so it's now switched over now to the wireless, and if I jump in there, I can still do all the things I would normally do on the, well, I can still do most of the things I'd still do on the computer. For example, I can still rate the image. Sure. The rating, I can still jump in and see live view. I can still jump in and check focus at 100%. I can do those sort of things, but without any cable. And here we have a physical static setup, you know, tripod and arm. Right. We could also be, Lance and I could be running down the city sidewalks and you could <laughs> hold an iPad, I could hold a camera, we'd still have that communication. So the word tethering here, I would still use, but what's really important to understand here is phase has gone a different route. Since phase one makes the back body lenses and the software and the wireless transmitter that's built in already to the back. Yeah. We don't have the limitations you normally have on uh, a Canon or Nikon or Sony using those plugins. Yeah, right, right. Those are good plugins. They provide some cool tools. The limitation is that it's a third party making the physical hardware and then making the software. So the image has to be written to the card, then it has to be sent over to the device, the device has to receive it in full and then read it and then show you. Here, the moment the image is captured, it's already transmitting the resolution over to here. So if you're working with a client, this gets them off from over your shoulder. They right. can relax, they can go sit on the sofa, we were just grab saying. Grab a glass of wine. Grab a glass of wine and, and not be at your computer station or where you're shooting. But they can still comment, they can still see what's coming up. Right. Yeah. Let me show the camera control features yeah. for yeah. when uh, someone's just viewing it. So let me show that speed run one more time. All right, quick. So now that we got it going. I'll do a lizard turn here, click. Lizard turn pops up, lizard turned, click, pops right back up. So That's it's not fantastic. waiting for the 100, because I think it's about 100 megapixel file. If I, had to, if I had to wait for the card to write the 100 megapixel raw, oh, yeah. and then send a JPEG or a raw over. It could take a substantial amount of time, and yeah. One of the ways you can get around that with those little plugins is to send a small JPEG. And that can actually pretty, work pretty fast. The problem is that you're only getting a limited resolution here. Right. This if I tap on that image, it's now going to request the screen resolution version of it. If I double tap, it'll then request that part of that image wow. at 100%. Oh my gosh. And so you can see it loading in 100% detail on an image moments after you capture it at 100% for 100 megapixel file. So you're getting the speed of sending a small file, but you're getting the quality of sending the full file. But you're not sending any file at all. <laughs> also worth noting is how wireless we got the we're working with the Pro Photo. Would you say these were the these B B ones? So there are no wires other and that's plugged in something else. But like this entire setup is pretty much wireless right now. Right. So the light itself has a Pro Photo Air receiver. That light has a Pro Photo Air receiver. And, and they're the, controlled from the camera. And the, the camera menu. itself yeah. has a Pro Photo transmitter built in. So we can actually we can not only control to fire the flash. But we also get in here the Pro Photo controls directly on the digital back. So I could say turn my main light up by a stop or two stops. Oh, man. And you saw the light flash behind yeah, me. I did. I'll take another picture. Now we'll be overexposed, presumably. Yeah. So now you see our exposures come up on our main light. And also, we have with the latest feature update the ability to trigger uh, the camera via a second Pro Photo air channel. Sure. So if oh, we wow. want to do wireless triggering via the transmitter, we can. They enable the second channel. So if you have a huge set and maybe or remote, mixed, uh, yeah, the whatever it is. So I'm receiving yep. my like channel that. two, so if you turn that on and set it's channel two. Channel two, okay. And then you push test. So now Boom. it's transmitting from his hand on channel two. It's receiving on channel two and triggering the camera, but then it's triggering the lights on channel one. So that when he pushes <laughs> test, it doesn't fire the flash, right? Otherwise the flash would fire when he hits it. Right, right, right. And also when the picture's taken. We 
are set up to do some tabletop and we are working on some tulips here. And what we're going to do is Doug is going to roll us through focus stacking, focus stacking. on this. So in this, I'm going to pull this up so they can see it. This, if you look at the side, is a wide depth there. You could conceivably get all of that in focus if you wanted to. It would take, we're talking maybe a hundred shots, something like that. Artistically though, we were looking at this and maybe that's not the right solution right here. What we're doing is, a, is extending our depth of field, so to speak. I think that's exactly right. People tend to sort of jump, when you say the word focus stack, they jump to the extreme end. Of everything, F64. just assume, yeah, you're gonna yeah. be using uh, 50 shots to go from the very, very first thing in the frame to the very, very back thing in the frame. Right. And sometimes that's probably the right answer to the image problem that you're trying to solve. But a lot of the time, the focus stacking is two or three frames. And the focus tagging is not to get from front to back, but to get a little bit more than you otherwise would. Gotcha. And before we talk about focus tagging, we should probably kind of quickly touch on, well, why the heck don't we just set it to F32 or F45 or F64? Reasonable question, sure. And the answer is that for all cameras, this isn't about phase, it's about any camera with a lens and a sensor. Once you get past a certain number, you get softer again. So as you're wide open, you're maybe a little bit soft because of lens aberrations because the lens isn't perfect. Yep. As you stop down to F8, F11, the lens really sharpens up. As you get to 16 or 22, the lens starts to become diffracted. Yes. That's a physics concept. You know, you can just basically Google uh, lens diffraction. Lens or, diffraction. Right. You can start to see images of this. But the point is we can't just say, hey, if we want the first five bulbs in this image in focus, we'll just keep, keep going. Well, here is, you know, here's the shot at F12, and you can see that we're already in focus from the first bulb to the second bulb, but that third and fourth bulb are out of focus. Yeah. I can't just keep going. I can't go from 12 to say 32 or 22 just because not, of the fraction. Right, yeah. So instead what I'm gonna You're do- You're gonna have something use, soft. Exactly, it's right. gonna, everything's gonna be equally soft. Yeah, right. So we'll get the equality <laughs> part, but we won't get the sharpness. Not like we want it, right. So what we're gonna do instead is we're gonna use the focus stack tool built into the phase one XF. We're gonna swipe across to that tool. Okay. Gotcha. We're going to say where are we currently focused. It's going to find our current point of focus. We're going to use either live view or through the lens okay. to modify the focus until we're in the right spot. We're going to save that as the front. We're going to go back until the last bulb is in focus. And we're going to save that as the back. Gotcha. And that is not the back bulb of all of the balls, the back bulb that I want to be in focus. Right, right, right. Because we're not doing the whole thing. We're just doing almost half, maybe not even that. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So now it's calculated for us. It's going to take seven frames. Okay, gotcha. One of my favorite things about the focus stack tool in the XF is it lets you fail quickly. That right. is, if I don't want to take seven shots to get this in focus, I know that I can come back to the home screen, change the aperture to F16. I'll lose a little bit to diffraction. Capture One has a diffraction correction that will help get some of that detail back. So 16 is going to be a little bit less advantageous than 12. But that would drop the number of frames from, what did I just say it was? Uh, seven. seven. From seven, seven down to five. Okay. Okay, so now I'm at five frames. I push the button to capture. And it just does its magic. And it's moving the lens each time, capturing that image in sequence. And actually applying the sequence number in the metadata. So those images could then be thrown into Capture One, processed out to TIFFs, and here I have them open in Zareen Stacker. Mm -hmm. And we run those software through, and right now we're at the stage where we're telling it what to ignore because it's background. That's what that black is indicating. That black is indicating. So okay. I don't want to include any very much black at all on the flowers. Right. But I do want to make sure there's some black in the background. And we push OK. And it will start to now actually go back through the images and build the image from back to front, or wow. from front to back. It will build the image up as we're watching it. So there you go. So there's the first frame, you can the see second frame, in. third. Wow. It looks a little bit cartoonish during this phase as it's illustrating its stack, as it finally comes into the final image. Yeah, that's actually really helpful to be able to see where it is. Exactly. You know, if it's you have something really complex going, going, yeah, you'd need to be able to double check, hey, this didn't work or whatever. And now we can zoom into 100%. Wow. And we can see the, the detail continues from this front bulb, back through the leaves. But we're back in Capture One, and we have two different focus stacks uh, that we have in this folder. One of the nice things about Capture One is that when you're using the Phase One XF focus stacking, it actually tags the stack with a metadata ID, so we oh, can nice. say, hey, just show me the five shots from the first focus stack, or the seven shots from the second focus stack. 
and you'll just deal with those files at a time. Very cool. So let's, for example, jump in here and take a look at these seven. If we look at these images, and we were to, say, zoom in to 100%, we can see where this shot was in focus, mm -hmm. and then we come forward to the next frame. So you're just going in focus. sequence, that's the next one. Yep, and the next one, and the next one, yep, and then this will come in focus, up. and then this comes in focus, and then wow. here at the very end, the very last frame, the front bulb will come in focus. So you can see between the previous and the next, just small, controllable, discrete, overlapping steps. Yep. So there's the, the bottom line of focus stacking is that in these seven images, one of those seven images has everything from here to there in focus. That's cool. So you gotta smush them together before and after focus stack, and you can already see here, sharp, 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 whereas mm -hmm. over here, it's only sharp along that specific Yep, I mean, it's leaf. soft in the front. Yep. So it's a big difference between focus stacking and a single frame here, uh, and it's done with very little user intervention, a lot of automation. Uh, you are making the point earlier about HDR, you know, and the tools that people have, and the bad rap that that's gotten because it's just overused, you know? And, uh, Anytime you take a tool to its extreme purely for the fact that you can use it to that extreme, mm -hmm. I think you're giving up some of the art and craft of photography. You want to first ask, how will this image be improved, and will this tool help me do that? Right. No, I think that's amazing. Looks good. Looks and so then cool. we also had just shot with uh, a very special lens. This is the IMAX 130 f2 lens. Uh, this lens is a lens that I picked up and we did a blog article on called Big Buttery Bokeh. And it's all about <laughs> lenses that have extraordinarily shelled at the field, but also interesting characteristic in the autofocus areas. Right. So this lens has somewhat of a Petzval swirl uh, that creates a little bit of a spherical deformation in the autofocus areas. It's not that pronounced at macro distances like this. So as you can see here, it's a little bit more just creamy. But look at the sort of halation. Yeah. Look at the sort of distortion we get as things go from in to out of focus. This is not an optically clean lens. It's no. not a lens that has perfect, pristine characteristics. It's a lens that has a lot of character. It's got some soul, right? Yeah, that's cool. I can't wait to see what you do with this lens tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs>